Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another OIC options presentation. My name is Mark Benzaquin, and I am a principal of OCC Investor Education. And we've got something special for you today. Um, besides talking about the covered call, which uh, inarguably is one of the most popular option strategy out there, we're going to take a deeper dive into the strategy by uh, looking at planning the position as well as a question that we get asked most here at OIC uh, is managing that position. Uh, so uh, whether you're a options beginner and absolutely new to the product or a more seasoned trader, we certainly hope that we have something for everybody. Uh, before we get started, some housekeeping tips here. Uh, options involve risks and may not be suitable for everyone. Uh, for you options beginners, in order to begin trading options, you'll need to have your account approved by your trading firm. And part of that approval process uh, is your acknowledgement that you have read and understood the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Uh, that booklet can be obtained in electronic format on our website, or you can uh, ask your broker for our hard copy. Uh, in addition, in order to simplify everything that we're going to be talking about today in the examples, uh, we're not going to be discussing commissions, fees, uh, interest, uh, other costs that may impact your trade and impact your account. And again, any strategies that we discuss today are simply used for illustrative purposes. Uh, now, that being said, for those of you not familiar with OIC, we are a resource provided by OCC, the Options Clearing Corporation, and we are uh, a free and professional education resource. Most of our resources are offered on our website, optionseducation.org, where we offer interactive online courses, podcasts, videos, and, of course, the OIC webinar series. Uh, the pride and joy of OIC is our investor education team. Uh, we are fortunate enough to have Ed Mondla and Ken Keating behind the scenes today taking your uh, questions live as they come in. So feel free to uh, use the Q&A box on your console to ask questions at any time. You can also get in touch with us via email at options at the OCC.com. And for those of you that prefer a more one-on-one uh, -on -one engagement on our website, there is a live chat feature. So uh, feel free to use that to discuss with us all things options. Speaking of all things options, uh, you, you may have uh, seen this slide before. Uh, options volume recently is uh, at record levels 2020. Um, options traded over 7 billion contracts. Uh, the record volume for a single day was just over 60 million, and in 2021, we are averaging over 30 million option contracts a day. So the product itself uh, attracting a lot of new interest and certainly new demand for the product. So speaking of the options product, let's get into one of the most popular options strategy there is, and that is the covered call. Um, for those of you new to the covered call, we're going to start out with options basics. Uh, what is a covered call and why do we use them? Uh, and we're also going to provide an example. And then we're going to take a deeper dive uh, into some of the more uh, esoteric concepts, such as planning the trade and, most importantly, managing the trade. And hopefully if we have some time at the end, we'll take some live Q&A. But again, please keep in mind that Ed and Ken are behind the scenes taking your questions as they come in. I also want to mention below your uh, media viewer, there is a resource list, which includes a uh, download link for all of the slides here in the course. So uh, if you want to download those and follow along or uh, make notes as you go, uh, certainly make sure that you download that feature. So that being said, covered call basics. What is a covered call and why do we use it? Well, simply put, a covered call is when an investor simultaneously sells a call option uh, and buys the equivalent number of shares. As each option typically represents 100 shares of stock, uh, the balance of the trade would be buying 100 shares of stock and selling one call against it. 
Now, you could also already have those shares of stock in your account without having to purchase them to go along with that short option contract. And that's one of the things that makes the covered call strategy so popular, for example, with retirees that have amassed a uh, equity or a stock portfolio um, over, the, uh, over their investing life. And the primary goal of doing the covered call, why do we use such a strategy, is simply to increase returns on the shares that we own. That premium that we collect when we sell that option contract is ours to keep regardless of what happens with the trade. So it's a great way, or I should say it could be a great way to generate uh, additional income over and above the shares by themselves. Uh, another thing uh, with the covered call that we do need to point out is the investor forecast. Just like with any trade, uh, forecast is uh, the, the most important. We need to figure out as an investor where we think that stock is going to go and uh, possibly how long is it going to take to get there. So the forecast with the covered call is that we're neutral to moderately bullish on the stock, meaning that we think the stock is going to be trading within a specific range. Uh, if we were overly bullish or overly bearish on the stock, this certainly may not be the strategy for us. So neutral to moderately bullish is the forecast for the covered call writer. And the reason uh, I had mentioned that, uh, for example, you're not uh, – overly bullish or aggressively bullish is simply because the uh, one of the risks of the covered call is that our stock may get called away. If we are aggressively bullish on a stock and we think that it's going to uh, you know, increase significantly over the next few weeks or next few months, and with today's market, that certainly is not unheard of. Uh, if we are uh, aggressively bullish, then likely we don't want that stock to get called away. So um, the uh, covered call strategy may not be for you. So again, that neutral to moderately bullish outlook. And the reason is the primary risk, well, there's actually two risks in the covered call. Um, first and foremost, uh, a risk is that we uh, may be subject to have those shares called away from us. We have the obligation to sell those shares if we get assigned at that strike price. Um, that assignment can happen at any time, though truth be told, assignment generally doesn't occur until expiration. Uh, however, um, we should be aware that if there's a dividend involved, and assuming we're writing calls on equity options, uh, equity options are American style, so uh, which means that they can be uh, exercised and assigned at any time. Uh, so if there's a dividend involved, then typically uh, there is a, a risk for early assignment. But uh, the, uh, the, the risk of assignment is real. So the covered call writer needs to be prepared and needs to be willing to accept selling those shares. Now, keep in mind, selling the shares isn't necessarily a bad thing, and this is something that we'll discuss towards the end of uh, today's session. Um, but I had mentioned uh, one of the risks uh, is in the uh, assignment and selling the shares. Another risk is certainly uh, in the long stock position uh, itself, which is something that we'll get into in just a moment. But in return for that obligation, in return for accepting those risks, that call writer is paid the options premium, and that premium, again, is theirs to keep regardless of the outcome of the trade. So some of the limitations uh, in terms of profit and loss for the covered call, our profit potential is limited. Uh, again, I had mentioned that we have the obligation to deliver those shares if we get assigned. So uh, that is going to limit our profit potential. If the stock goes to 100 uh, let's say $100 a share, and we write a call option at $95, well, we are obligating ourselves to sell that stock at $95. So it doesn't matter if the stock goes to 100 or if it goes to 1,000, we are obligated to sell those shares. So our profit is limited, uh, and it's limited by the difference between the strike price and the uh, stock price that we paid plus that call premium we received. And we'll, again, we'll look at that in just a moment. Um, the break-even point is going to be the difference between the price at which we uh, bought the stock and the premium that we receive. Again, we'll 
look at that in a little bit more depth in just a moment. And building on what I mentioned earlier in terms of the risks of the covered call writer, the downside loss is uh, potentially substantial. The primary risk in such a strategy is in the long stock itself. That stock can theoretically go to zero, uh, which means that because we're buying 100 shares of stock, we could lose that entire stock investment. Now, of course, that would be tempered somewhat uh, by the premium that we collect, but uh, that uh, downside loss potential of the long stock is something that we really need to be aware of and keep our eye on. And if things do look like they're heading south, uh, then it's time to manage the position, and that's something that, that this session is all about, how to do so. So let's look at an example of a covered call, let's say we own 100 shares of stock or we purchase 100 shares of stock and it's currently trading at $100 a share. Uh, again, that forecast, we're neutral to moderately bullish. And um, like I said, we when we plan a trade, we need to figure out where the stock is going to go and how long it's going to take to get there. In this case, we're saying that um, the stock is going to trade uh, range bound neutral to moderately bullish over the next few months and because of that we're looking to generate additional income if we own 100 shares of stock and the stock doesn't go anywhere for the next three months well we're not going to make any money on it so by selling the covered call it allows us to generate a, a little bit of uh, extra income in that and here's our target we've got a target price for 105 meaning that we think the stock is going to go up uh, to 105 possibly at the most so our choice is that we sell a 105 strike call and for that we collect a premium of three dollars and 75 cents and numerically let's take a look at what we have here how that shakes out so assuming that we buy our stock at a hundred dollars if the stock doesn't go anywhere we're not going to make any money on it right that's what we just discussed if the stock doesn't go anywhere above 100 no money changes hands however we sold this option for three dollars and 75 cents so at expiration we would keep that three dollars and 75 cents assuming we're not getting assigned and that would result in a total profit of three dollars and 75 cents so if the stock doesn't go anywhere we're still going to make 375 now we sold the 105 strike call so if the stock does go up to 105 we'll have made a five dollar profit on the stock we'll have made a three dollar and 75 cent profit on the option for a total profit of eight dollars and 75 cents so again that uh, premium that we receive gets added to our total profit uh, but you can see here because our stock gets called away or we have the risk of getting our stock get called away at 105 even if stock keeps running up if it goes to 110 theoretically we made ten dollars on the stock but we have a loss now on the option of a dollar 25 and that gives us the profit of 875 so in this particular scenario no matter where the stock goes above our strike price we're going to have a maximum profit of $8.75. Now, conversely, let's say the opposite happens, and rather than increasing the stock, uh, the stock declines in value or the stock crashes. If stock goes down to 95, we're gonna lose $5 on those shares. Remember I mentioned that uh, our primary risk is in that long stock position. So we lose $5 on the stock, but we profited $5, I'm sorry, $3.75 on our option. So that reduces our loss uh, to where our loss is $1.25. And that loss is going to continue to increase dollar for dollar as that stock declines. Um, it, and again, remember that loss is going to be tempered by that 375. So if stock uh, happens to go to zero, well, we're going to lose everything but that $3.75. So that is uh, an example of how that covered call works. Now let's go ahead and take that a step further. Uh, one moment here. So we're going to go ahead and take that uh, step further, looking at a profit and loss graph. Now, uh, again, for those of you new to trading options, uh, some people 
are more um, uh, numerically uh, capable. So the, the graph that we just looked at, plotting out your uh, profit and loss points at various uh, stock prices is a very, very helpful way to see what may happen to your trade uh, as the market moves up and down. Other people are more, uh, other people learn better visually. And this profit and loss graph is, is really one of the best tools uh, of the options investor. Uh, it shows you where, uh, how much you can make or lose depending on where that stock is. So in this case, we've got our profit and loss graph. Uh, the green line, this is our long stock position, $100. Uh, our maximum profit, as we had mentioned, is going to be $875. So that is going to be, we bought stock at $100. We're selling it at $105, right? That's our strike price. So it's a $5 profit on the stock, plus we collected $3.75 when we sold the option. So that gives us $8.75 or $875 total. So that's going to be our maximum profit up here, regardless of where stock goes. Now, our break-even point, remember, we said is simply going to be our share price minus the premium that we received. So in this case, it's $96.25, and that's represented right here where our P&L chart um, uh, crosses the axis. So anything above 96.25 uh, at expiration, we're going to be profitable. Uh, anything below 96.25 in terms of share price, that's where we're going to begin uh, losing money. Okay. So now that's the basis of what covered calls are and why we use them. Let's get into something a little bit more conceptual. Um, anytime that we do an option trade, whether it's a covered call, whether it's an iron condor, or buying a put, what have you, any strategy, we really need to start with a plan. Um, the best traders out there, the most successful investors out there, will tell you that uh, you know, simply buying an option uh, on a meme stock or you know, basically throwing a dart at a board and investing in a security is not the most successful route for the long-term investor. The most successful route starts with a plan. Uh, one of the phrases that we uh, used to have on the trading floor is plan the trade and uh, tr plan the trade and trade the plan. So in this case, with the covered call, we need to figure out our money situation. We're going to start with our investment dollars. We're buying 100 shares of stock. Are we buying that stock for the full cash amount or are we purchasing it on margin? What stock are we looking to purchase, right? Uh, remember, our forecast is neutral to moderately bullish. So what do we think is going to happen with that stock? And in what time frame are we looking? Are we looking to uh, buy the stock and sell that option? Is that option going to be in, at, or out of the money? And though we won't get uh, too deep into it today, each of those uh, scenarios, in the money, at the money, out of the money, come with it, uh, a different risk-reward profile. Obviously, if we're selling in-the-money options, we're going to be collecting more premium, um, but we also have increased risk of having those shares called away. If we're selling an out-of-the-money call, for example, we're going to be collecting less premium, but there is less likelihood that our shares will be called away, and it affords us a uh, a larger maximum profit. So we'll look at a couple of these scenarios today, but the idea is that, you know, as responsible investors, we're looking to um, plan our trade. We want to have an idea as to when to get into the position and equally as important, when to get out. And here's what I mean by that. Not only do we need to know what stocks we're going to buy and, and how we're going to invest uh, in, in that option uh, trade, but we need to be willing and prepared to sell our shares at that strike price, uh, assuming that we get assigned. So what we need to do is, is we need to be prepared to sell the shares. If we don't want to sell the shares, then we need to manage that position. Do we simply close out the position ahead of time? and hold on to our shares, or do we manage the trade some other way? 
Um, another ways of, of being successful is the proverbial don't put all your eggs in one basket. You know, diversify our trade. Have uh, different strategies on different stocks. Um, in terms of covered calls, you know, uh, there's a way to uh, buy a what we call a leaps contract, a long-term security instead of buying the stock and selling short-term covered calls against it. So there's different ways to diversify our trades, whether we're writing long-term, uh, buying long-term calls and selling short-term calls against it, uh, a variety of in the money, at the money, out of the money, what have you. But the idea is that, uh, again, we don't have all of our eggs in one basket and we're looking to diversify what it is that we're doing. And, uh, you know, when it comes to options, options aren't like some stocks where you simply buy it, put it in the drawer, and forget about it. Options are uh, an actively managed security. So we're looking to uh, put on the trade, hopefully be profitable, close out that trade, and do it again, rinse and repeat. So we're always looking for more opportunities to invest and uh, become successful. So managing covered calls, this is what I think uh, most of you are turning in for. Uh, it's a question that we receive most often uh, in the comments that people leave us uh, at the end of our webinars, the survey that you'll see. Uh, one of the most common uh, recommendations or uh, asks of our attendees is you know, more presentations on managing the position. So let's go ahead and get into that. First and foremost, getting out of the position is always a consideration. One of the most difficult trades that uh, you will ever make as a trader is closing out a losing position and accepting and locking in that loss. The hardest trade you make uh, may often be the one that locks in that loss for you. So getting out is always a consideration. Maybe that's the best plan. Uh, accepting assignment, whether it's a, or for early exercise or dividend, are you okay um, with letting those shares go? If not, then position management is something that we're going to need to look into. Rolling the position, I'm sure most of you uh, have heard about rolling, whether it's up, down, or up and out, or down and out. Basically, what rolling is, and we'll get into that in just a moment, is closing out your existing position and opening a new one. And, and the reason that we do that is to, um, as you can see here, is either to adjust our break-even points, either lower them or raise them, or we may uh, roll a position for leverage. If we're profitable on the trade, let's say, and we've got more than one contract, well, maybe we'll close out one position we'll close out one contract and take that money off the table um, and simply, in, in a sense, play with the house money on the rest. Um, or we can use that money to buy additional contracts. So leverage is something that uh, position management can afford us. We may have to spend more money to do it, or we may collect more money by rolling our position. Um, and if we're rolling out, whether it's up or down, we are going to be buying or selling more time. And as you know, we're all familiar with the concept, time is money. If you're buying more time, we're going to be paying money to do so. Um, the thing that most investors do try to avoid is selling that stock ahead of time and leaving yourself with a naked call position. Uh, the reason being is, remember, that short call that we sold is being covered uh, by that stock. Our obligation is covered by the stock that we own. If we no longer own those shares because we sold them out early, that leaves us with a naked call. And uh, speaking of call, you'll probably be getting a, a phone call from your broker letting you know that uh, additional margin is going to be required for that new um, uncovered naked call position that you have. So rolling a covered call up, what it involves is uh, closing out that short call position. So we're buying that short call uh, at, the, the, for example, here we've got the June 80 call. We would be buying that to close. 
and we would be selling another call with a higher strike price. So in a sense, what we're doing is we originally were long 100 shares of stock and we were short the $80 call in June. Now we're going to close out that $80 strike and we're going to turn it into an 85 strike. When we roll out, it's always going to be done at a net debit. The higher the strike, the um, uh, cheaper it's going to be. So if we're buying back a more expensive strike and then selling a cheaper strike on top of that, it's going to cost us money. So we're going to be putting out more capital by uh, rolling up that position. It's also going to raise our break-even point. If it costs us $200, to roll out that position or to roll up that position, I should say, it's going to raise our break-even point by that amount as well. However, the advantage and the reason that you know somebody may look to roll up their position is because it increases our maximum profit potential. Um, remember, our profit potential is going to be the difference between the stock price and the strike price in addition to the premium that we collect. If we widen that um, that range, the $100 call and I'm sorry, the $100 stock and a 105 strike, if we make that $100 stock and 110 strike, well, we've just increased our maximum profit or uh, the potential profit. So rolling up, basically we're closing out the short position. We're creating a new short position at a higher strike. It's going to cost us money to do so, which is going to raise our break-even point, but it's also going to increase our maximum profit potential. Rolling down is going to be, obviously, the complete opposite. We're still closing out that position. We're buying back that June 80 call to close, but now instead of selling the 70, I'm sorry, instead of instead of selling the $85 strike we're going to be rolling it down and selling the 75 strike, the more expensive strike, which means that we're going to be doing the trade at a net credit. So we're going to be putting more money back into our pocket. It's also going to lower our break-even point by that amount, but it's also going to decrease our maximum profit potential. Um, so just like by rolling up, it's going to be at a net debit, and uh, it's going to increase our break-even point rolling down is going to be at a net credit and it's going to lower our break-even point. So that is the difference between rolling up and rolling down. Now, when we roll our trade, whether we're going up or down, technically it's a spread order. Uh, a spread order is anything more than one leg, more than one trade. And in this case, we're going to be looking to do one trade, one ticket. So we're going to buy that existing short call back to close. We're going to sell a new call, whether it's at a higher strike, at a lower strike. We're going to sell that new call to open, and that is our spread trade. We're going to be executing both of them on one ticket, so we're going to do it simultaneously. And the net effect of the two prices, that is going to determine whether we're doing it for a credit or a debit. Um, you may have heard of the term legging a trade, which means that you're basically doing um, one side of the trade at once, uh, at one time, and then doing the other side of the trade at another time. Uh, it certainly has its risks and uh, potential benefits, I guess, uh, uh, depending on what the market does. But but that's just the point. You're at the risk of the market. Um, and at the market is a living, breathing thing. You never know what's going to happen from one moment to the next. So you do have that market risk between when you are buying back that short call to close and selling out that new short call to open. The market can move in your favor or against you. So when we do the trade, it is a spread order. As it's a spread order, you're going to want to discuss with your a trading firm, whether or not you are approved to trade spreads. Um, some brokers may not um, look at this as a, uh, some brokers may not look at this as a spread order per se and allow you to do it even if you are not um, approved to trade normal spreads. So definitely something you'll want to discuss with your broker regarding that. Back to the plan, we're taking the plan a little bit further. Um, we had discussed 
how the hardest trade that you can make is when to get out of that trade. So not only is it as important to know when to get in, but when to get out. How much of a loss are you willing to accept? This is uh, the uh, what we have here, the disciplined approach. This is what the disciplined trader does. They say, um, all right, I'm investing X amount of dollars. Once I make a 20% profit, and, and I'm just throwing out some arbitrary uh, numbers, this is certainly not rule of thumb. Once I make 20% on my trade, I'm going to close it out. Or um, actually what a more seasoned investor would do possibly is once I make 20%, I'm going to reassess. Um, but the, the idea being is that you've got a plan um, in terms of profit and in terms of loss. How much loss am I willing to accept? Am I willing to accept a 20% loss on my trade before I manage it? Am I willing to accept a 50% loss before I manage it? Maybe even decide to pull the plug and lock in that loss and live to play another day. Again, plan the trade and, and trade the plan. The, the, the point being is that, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, when it comes to trading, it is an actively managed security. You are always looking uh, to see what the market is doing, see what the stock and the option is doing, but um, even even more so, you're reassessing your forecast on an almost daily basis. Do I still think the stock is going to go to X, or do, uh, am I tempering my forecast and think it's going to, you know, be a few dollars short? Or is there, you know, pending news coming out that uh, may send the stock even higher? So you're always looking to your forecast and reassessing and, um, uh, you know, kind of regaging what you think is going to happen. And when some of those uh, milestones uh, occur, for example, you think the stock is going to go to 105, if we're getting close to that point, it might be time to uh, reassess, make a decision based on your forecast. If you think it's still going to go higher, maybe we take a more bullish or a more aggressive approach to our covered call. If you think that the stock is never go going to, uh, you know, make it to where you thought it was going to, you know, maybe it's time to uh, reassess and uh, to, for example, roll down. Uh, the idea being is that um, you need to uh, you need to be active. Um, you need to have your eyes open and your head clear as to. What can happen? What is your tolerance for risk? How much of a loss are you willing to accept? And keep in mind, your brokerage firm uh, often is going to be your best source for uh, advice or recommendations. Um, assuming that you are uh, with a, for example, with a full service broker, you are paying for their expertise. So definitely take advantage of that. Now, this is a scenario that we're going to be using throughout the rest of the presentation. This is our example. Um, and we're going to use this example to roll up, roll down, roll out, et cetera. Um, here's our forecast. We're neutral to, to moderately bullish. Stock is trading $59. So we're going to go ahead and buy 100 shares of stock up front, which is going to be a $5,900 invest, uh, investment, assuming we're doing it in a cash account. Our initial forecast, again, neutral to moderately bullish. We think the stock's going to go up, but not too much. We only think it's going to increase uh, by a dollar over the next 60 days. However, we're able to collect a $4 premium on that March 60 call. One of the reasons being is because we're trading 60 days out, and within 60 days, anything can happen. And we're just out of the money. Uh, the stock is only a dollar out of the money. And within the net, that uh, 60 days, uh, there certainly is a, a possibility for the uh, share price to hit 60 or beyond. And the market is placing a rather significant, uh, significant time premium on that contract. So uh, we're buying 100 shares for $59. We're going to sell the $60 call. For that, we collect a premium of $4. Now, again, here's our long stock position with the red dotted line. We're long 100 shares from 59. And here is our profit and loss graph on the option. We're selling one March 60 call for $4. That gives us a net total investment of 5,500. Remember, we paid 5,900 for the stock. 
were collecting $4 or $400 per option contract, net investment 55. That's also going to be our break-even point. If stock finishes anywhere above $55, we're going to be profitable up to our maximum. If stock finishes below $55, we're going to lose because of the risk of that long stock position. Uh, again, those of you that uh, seen numbers better than images, here's a, um, a chart that better represents what we just talked about. Again, our break-even point is $55. As you can see, if we bought stock for 50, 59 stack goes down to 55 we're going to lose 400 on the stock but we collected 400 on the option that gives us a net profit and loss of zero anything above that 55 dollars will make money up into our maximum of 500 anything below that 55 we're going to go ahead and lose dollar for dollar on that minus the 400 dollars that we put into it so again stock goes down to zero we're going to lose everything but 400 dollars so that's the initial position that we're going to look at that we're going to carry over throughout the rest of this uh, presentation. And let's see what happens if the stock goes down or stock goes up. So stock goes down. And uh, again, remember, we're reassessing our forecast. Now uh, we are still moderately bullish and we choose to do nothing. We still have six weeks until expiration. The stock is at our break even point. Uh, so if it does go below that $55, we're going to start losing money. Uh, if it goes above $55, we'll begin making money again. But we're committed to that moderately bullish forecast. So we decide to do nothing. And sometimes, you know, that is a choice as well. Um, you know, the, the uh, proverb, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. Well, that's, that's our situation here. Uh, we're choosing to do nothing because we're still moderately bullish and we think the stock is still uh, has a chance of going to where we think. However, that's risky. We're right at that break even point. If something happens and stock continues to decline, we're going to begin to lose money. So, uh, again, we've got six weeks out. Maybe it's time to reassess uh, a week down the road, two weeks down the road. Uh, but the idea being is that um, – the idea being is that we're always going to be reassessing as we go along. Now, another situation, shares down again. The stock is plummeted now. Um, we're no longer moderately bullish. Now we're pretty nervous. Stock plummets continues to decline. Our unrealized losses are mounting. We are now very bearish. Remember, before we were moderately bullish, we are now very bearish. So, you know, it's time to abandon ship. Uh, again, sometimes that hardest trade is the one that locks in a loss. We're going to go ahead and sell our stock. We're going to go ahead and buy that call back to close, and we're going to get out of that position. All right. Now, that's not the only possibility. If shares go down, maybe we're defensive. Uh, we still have plenty of time for something to happen. Uh, the stock is at our break-even point. But and now we want to be defensive. So we're looking to um, curb the potential for a loss, and we're going to decide to roll down our contract. Before, we had sold the uh, $60 call. Uh, we are now going to buy that back to close, and we are going to roll down that $60 call down to a 55 strike. And that 55 strike is trading for a $3 premium. Remember, the lower the strike when it comes to calls, the more expensive the option. So we're going to sell that 55 strike call at $3. We're going to buy back that short $60 call. It was trading $4 with stock at 59. It's now trading a dollar with stock at 55. So we're going to buy that back, and it's going to put a $2 credit in our pocket. That also is going to lower our break-even point. Our break-even point was $55. Now it's 53 So it gives us a little bit of a cushion. Uh, remember, before we were losing money at 55 and anything below $55. Now between uh, you know anything above 53 we're going to make money. So it, get, it lowers that break-even point, gives us more of a cushion to play with uh, in terms of the stock. However, 
if we do get assigned on those shares, if stock, uh, if shares, you know, stay right around that $55 level and we get assigned, we're going to be selling that stock at 55, not at 60, which means that that's going to decrease our maximum profit. Before we had a $5 maximum profit, now our maximum profit is down to $2. And let's look at that here on our chart. Here's our original position. We sold the $60 call, um, gave us a break-even point of 55. Now we've got, we roll it down to the 55 strike call. It lowers our break-even point to 33. Remember, there's that cushion that we have now, but we didn't have before. However, it's also reducing our maximum profit. Our maximum profit went from 500 down to two. So with any trade, there's always a trade-off, right? Uh, more risk means more reward. Less risk often means less reward. And that's the case here. We're uh, taking less risk by lowering that break-even point. And uh, in, in doing so, the trade-off is that we're also foregoing any um, upside profit potential beyond that, uh, beyond that $55 strike. So I hope that's clear. Um, that's the rolling down. Now we're going to go ahead and look at rolling up. So I had mentioned before about being aggressively bullish. Again, we're six weeks out. Uh, we thought the stock was maybe going to go to 60 within that 60-day uh, period. Well, you know, lo and behold, something happens. Uh, you know, the, the, the CEO tweets out something and, and the stock blows up. It's now trading $64. That March call that we bought, no, I'm sorry, that we sold earlier for $4, it's now trading five and a quarter. So theoretically, we've got an unrealized profit of $3.75. But we're very bullish, right? We think the stock is going to continue to increase beyond our $60 strike, beyond the $64 where it's trading currently, and let's say we think it's going to go up a little bit more to 65 We want to increase our profit potential, not decrease it by uh, rolling down. So we're going to go ahead and roll that position up. And what that entails is, again, here's our original March 60 call. Uh, it's now trading for five and a quarter. Uh, the March 65 call, the higher strike call, remember, it's going to be cheaper. It's trading for two and a quarter. But we're going to have to buy back our more expensive options, sell the cheaper. It's going to cost us another $3 or $300 out of pocket. So by rolling up, remember, as we mentioned at the beginning, rolling up is going to be done at a debit. So we're increasing our break-even point by the amount of that debit as well. And uh, however, the advantage is that if we do get assigned, we're not going to be selling stock at 60. We're going to be selling stock at 65. So that's going to increase our maximum profit. Before we had a $5 maximum profit, now we've got a $7 maximum profit. Uh, and it's going to be the difference between the uh, higher share price if we do get assigned minus the debit that we paid. And let's look at this uh, on our graph again. Here's our original March 60 call. Now, by rolling up to the 65, here we go. We've increased our break-even point. All right, so the stock needs to go further in order for us to be profitable. But we're aggressively bullish, so we don't think that that's going to be a problem. That's the whole point of rolling up. We expect this to happen. We've also increased our maximum reward. Uh, remember, the lower the risk, lower reward, higher the risk, higher the reward. So we're increasing our risk by raising our break-even point, but we're also increasing our profit potential. So this is one of those good problems to have, right? Um, we're making a profit already. We're making money. Now we're trying to squeeze out uh, some more shekels, as my old boss used to say. Um, However, you know, uh, and one thing to keep in mind as uh, our good friend, uh, our good and old friend Bill Ryan used to say, you'll know, never go broke taking a profit. That's something that, uh, that I'll always remember. We're in a profitable position already. We're looking to extend that profitable position by rolling the strike up. Now, we can certainly just exit the position to, to begin with, take our profit, and live to play another day. Um, but the idea is that we wanted to squeeze out a little bit of something else. 
a uh, little something extra. So if we're in this position where our short call is at parity and we want to avoid early assignment, uh, you know, we could do a couple things. Maybe there's a dividend coming up and we're expecting to be assigned on this contract. So we can either close out that position or we can roll up to a higher strike. Um, we could roll up and out or just roll out for more time. Um, the idea of uh, the idea of being assigned is that when somebody exercises their contract, they are only exercising for their strike price, meaning that any time value that's left in that option contract uh, goes away once the investor, once the call buyer, for example, exercises. So if we roll up, maybe we're rolling up to a higher strike and now um, that strike is no longer in the money or at the money, now it's further out of the money, so maybe assignment isn't as great of a risk anymore, or we're rolling out for more time and uh, that simply adds more time value to that option contract. So if somebody did exercise that option contract, uh, let's say we're in the month of March right now, and that's the um, option contract that you have, uh, and you decide to roll it out to May, let's say. So if somebody were to exercise that May contract in the month of March, then they would be foregoing any time value. So by rolling that contract, whether it's up or up and out, uh, it's a, it, it may be a way to avoid that assignment by uh, managing that position. And again, you know, we can't stress this enough, um, your broker is a, a terrific source for uh, advice and uh, to have a discussion as to you know, what you should do. If you're looking for information as to what can happen as opposed to what you should do, then by all means get in touch with us here at OIC. Our investor services team uh, loves to speak with investors and educate them as to uh, the different possibilities of a trade, let's say. Uh, again, we can't provide advice, nor do we make recommendations, but we certainly are happy to be a sounding board and explain to you uh, the uh, risks and rewards of your position and trading options as a whole. So uh, definitely feel free to get in touch with us. <clears throat> Pardon me. So uh, at expiration, the stock has risen. We're in the money now and it's trading at parity. The most we can make on that trade is $5. Uh, and that's kind of where we are. So there's uh, no longer is this option uh, generating any return. The only thing that we have left on the table is risk. We've already achieved our maximum profit, uh, assuming we close the position. So it, that's the decision that we need to make. Do we close that position and move on to another trade? Um, or if uh, you know we like the stock and we think it's going to uh, continue, you know, maybe we uh, simply roll the trade out to reduce our cost basis, uh, possibly even you know reduce our um, uh, re reduce our cost basis and you know uh, change that break even point, change that uh, maximum profit potential. Uh, but the idea being is that we hold on to these uh, shares or simply close the position out and by position, meaning the option position, and just hang on to the shares and maybe you know sell another call uh, down the road or look for some other trade. So uh, we had talked earlier about, um, I alluded to some of the common um, misconceptions. Uh, for example, I had mentioned that uh, you know assignment isn't always a bad thing. So let's look at some of those misconceptions or some of those myths uh, when it comes to selling calls. For example, the larger the premium, the better. Um, certainly something that we hear from people all the time, well, I can sell this option for $4 or I can sell this one for a dollar. Wouldn't I be better off selling this one for four? Uh, the way that uh, I explain this to people, and it might be a bit blunt, um, but uh, the way I explain this to people is that, listen, the market is a heck of a lot smarter than you or I. The market is very, very efficient. Um, and where there's high premiums to be earned, it also means that there's high risk to be had. 
so you can sell in in the money contract uh, back to covered calls we can certainly sell an in the mo- in the money covered call and collect additional premium however the risk of assignment now is uh, significantly greater stocks trading fifty dollars I could sell a 55 strike call for maybe 50 cents or I could sell a 45 strike call maybe for six dollars the difference between the two is that uh, my profit potential on the out of the money call is uh, greater than the profit potential on the in the mo- on the in the money call number one number two the uh, likelihood of that in the money call getting assigned and me being forced to sell my $50 stock for $45 is significantly greater than with the out of the money call and me being forced to sell my $50 stock at $55. If I do sell it at $55, I've made $5 on the stock and I made 50 cents on the option. Um, if I do sell it at $45, I've lost $5 on the stock, but I've made $6 on the option. So that's only a net profit of a dollar. Uh, However, again, risk versus reward. The probability of earning that dollar with the the in-the-money call uh, may be tremendously greater than the probability of earning the $5.50 on the the out-of-the-money call. So there's always a trade-off, risk versus reward. Um, profit versus loss. There, there's always uh, there's always a trade-off, and for the investor, they need to balance that trade-off and figure out what best fits their risk profile. Being assigned is bad. This is uh, what we'd spoken about earlier. Um, being assigned is not bad. Uh, it, it not necessarily so. Think about this. Uh, we've got a fifty-dollar stock. We sell a $55 call against it. Typically, in order for that option to get assigned and deliver those shares, the stock needs to rally by 10%. The stock needs to rally by by $5. So granted, I'm giving away my stock, but I made a $5 profit on it. I made a 10% profit on the stock plus the uh, premium that I received on the option. Uh, the point that I'm trying to make is that in order to get assigned on that on the money call, stock needs to rally. So you're participating in that upside, um, in that upside movement. And what was your, you know, what was the reason that we traded this uh, strategy to begin with, right? We were looking to squeeze out a little bit of extra money from our shares. Well, not only did we do that by, you know, collecting a premium when we sold the option. But the shares themselves appreciated to a point where we thought that that they would. You know, there isn't anybody that I'm aware of that will hold on to a stock regardless of, of its price. You know, even even today with uh, the volatile markets as they are, uh, for you know the right price, anybody will sell their shares. I would expect. So the question is, what is that right price for you? And if it gets to that right price, then, uh, you know, there really shouldn't be any regrets in delivering that stock. So being assigned is bad, not necessarily. Uh, It certainly depends on the circumstances and depends on the investor. Um, Covered call writing forces you to sell winners and keep losers. Well, uh, just like any uh, option, any uh, security for that matter, it's going to require management, right? You're not forced to sell winners unless you look at it as, well, I made $5 on the stock and then I had to sell it. But, you know, you knew that going in. You you uh, were aware that that is a risk for the uh, – <clears throat> pardon me. You knew that that's a risk for the strategy to begin with. Um, but the idea being is that you are willing to deliver those shares at a price um, – at which you think the stock is going to go. Um, You thought the stock was going to go $5, and it did. You're willing to give those shares. Now, if you thought the stock was going to go $5 and it went up 10, well, that's a certainly different story. And if if that's the case, then it might be time to actively manage that position rather than letting those shares get called away. So uh, let's, uh, we've got a few minutes left. Let's go ahead and sum up some of the things that we've talked about today with covered calls. In, again, income generation, that's going to be our motivation for doing the trade. 
we're looking to squeeze out, uh, again, as my old boss used to say, squeeze out some more shekels from the stock that we already own. That downside protection is defined by uh, the value of the call sold. The risk is the long stock. What that means is we sell an option for $4. If stock goes to zero, we're going to lose everything but that $4. Um, and uh, just like any other option position, uh, it can be managed. We can adjust our strike uh, while the trade still exists. We can adjust our time frame while the trade still exists. Nothing is set in stone, and we can actively manage that position if we need to. Um, and then the last thing is that uh, you should know if assignment is acceptable. If you don't want to be assigned, uh, and as, as redundant as this may sound, the only way to avoid assignment is to have a non-assignable position, meaning that if you're not looking to have uh, to deliver those shares, close out that trade, close out that short call, um, and look to do either a different strategy uh, with that stock or simply look to roll out to avoid that assignment. But, you know, again, first and foremost, have a plan. Plan the trade and uh, uh, plan the trade and trade the plan. So before we get to Q&A, it looks like we do have a few uh, minutes left. I just want to familiarize everybody with OIC if they're not already. We are uh, an organization dedicated to increasing the awareness and the responsible use of options. Um, our OCC Learning is an interactive resource that we have on our website, online courses that you could take. You can also download podcasts and videos. Uh, attend our webinars, obviously, and then get live option help from uh, our investor services team. And here is some contact information. Uh, should you want to reach out to us, our website, optionseducation.org. Uh, our uh, email is options at the OCC.com. And uh, you can view us on our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, et cetera. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, and that is about it today. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that Ken and Ed have been responding to your questions uh, in the background, so uh, thank you for sending those in. Any questions that we did not get to today, we will follow up tomorrow, so make sure that you keep an eye on your email inbox for our responses. Please take a moment to fill out the survey at the end of the, se uh, end of the session. Let us know what you thought, and we're looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon.